make our worship service possible. Uh, let me offer now uh, a word of prayer myself. Can I do that? As soon as the screen is Let's close our eyes and say a word of prayer, and I bet when we open it, everything will be fine. God in heaven, we just continue in this, in this sweet spirit that is in this place, and we know, Lord, that your power, your blessings, your mercy is here with us, Lord. We thank you so much that you have called us your children and that you invite us to call us, or for, you invite us to call you our Father, pray in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, wonderful. Well, as you can see, we're going to continue in the theme of fatherhood um, for our worship today. And uh, my message is actually fairly straightforward, fairly uh, simple, even if I can put it that way. But uh, I think it's a worthy time to remind ourselves and re-engage uh, with this element of our world that God has given us, and to, to continue looking at the uh, aspect of what it means to have a father and to be a father. And so uh, this verse, uh, I think we know well, but uh, speaks to the great privilege of knowing the Lord is our father. See how great a love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God, and such we are. And I've mentioned this before um, in our, our, our worship and in our times together that we shouldn't race past this concept that as powerful as God is in all the ways that the Bible describes His sovereignty, that He's the creator of the universe, that He's the king, He's the Lord of lords, all of these grandiose titles that seem to separate Him from us, and in a good way, you know, obviously God is all those things. He's invisible, immortal, uh, sovereign, but at the same time, Jesus instructs us that when we lift up our hearts and pray, we are to address Him as our Father right? That's significant. You know, we're not instructed to pray to Him, oh, King of the universe. Now, that's fine. We can celebrate His authority and celebrate His dominion and His kingdom and refer to Him. I'm not saying that's wrong, but in our intimacy with God, He invites us. He instructs us to be reminded that He is first and foremost our Father, and we are His children. That is the great love that John talks about here. So, let's... let's um, talk about Jesus and, and uh, his father. I'm going to grab a couple mics here. I think red and black, Dennis, is that okay? And so Toby's going to help out. And then, um, Jaden, you're usually my second man uh, on the mic. So thank you. I got Jade in here. Thanks. You were right there on tap. But uh, give this young man a chance here. So uh, just some simple questions. Who is Jesus' earthly father? Do, do, do we know who he is at all? Does anyone here know Nobody knows? Oh, yes, some young men over here. So is it Kyle? All right, Kyle, who was it? The red one, is that one fired up and working? Give it a try. I couldn't quite hear you, Kyle. Say it again. Red has got a problem. But I think I heard him. Say it nice and loud. Joseph, is he right? Okay, we remember, we're reminded of this every Christmas, of course, when we remember the Holy Family. Um, and it says here in John, we have found him who Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, we know uh, that Jesus had a, uh, 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 another family lineage as well, but he did embrace the idea and the title of being the son of Joseph as well. All right, but he had another father, didn't he? So not to be too tricky with you today, but who was Jesus' heavenly father? I see Isaiah with his hand up. Ezra and Eric aren't really into it, I see, but we'll give them a chance at some point. Jacob, your eye is okay, right? So you can see and you could help out if you want. I'm just saying. Isaiah? God the Father. Oh, he's right, isn't he? Of course, we're not trying to be too, uh, too tricky here. The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for this reason, the Holy Child shall be called 
the Son of God. So Jesus uh, understood this. He had a duality about his fatherhood, and we'll talk briefly about that. Now, what is the last story that you can think of that includes Jesus' earthly father, Joseph? Was it there in Bethlehem? Was it when they fled to Egypt? What's the last story that you can think of where Joseph is present in Jesus' life? Any of our young people remember that story? Isaiah had a shot, but I want to see if any of our other young people can help out. Okay, I see Natalia up here, very bold, very brave. She's going to set the record straight. When he was 12 and Jesus got lost. Oh, very good. Now, you say Jesus got lost. I put it in quotes, right? Did Jesus get lost? Yeah, you know, it can be thought of that way, but obviously he was very purposeful at that young age and what he was doing, and uh, the story develops, and, and we'll, we'll reference that a little bit. So if that's the case, if that's the last time we read of Joseph, was he there then for Jesus' baptism or his miracles or at the cross? Was, Jesus, was Joseph there for those events? What do you think? Anyone want to guess? Any of our young people? Isaiah, do you want to you hazard a guess here, buddy? There's, there's, there's no, you know, I mean, it's okay, whatever you think. Yes. That's wrong, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Pastor Dave is so mean. No, obviously the Bible does not reference it, and that's the end. Toby and, and Jaden, thank you so much. You can just put the mics up at the front pew. Um, so he's never mentioned again, and so most Bible historians and commentators believe that he probably died. He probably died um, in Jesus' uh, teenage years or so. We don't know exactly. It's all a matter of historical debate and interpretation, but he's not ever mentioned again in, in any of the stories, um, and so Jesus um, understood what it meant to lose a father, lose an earthly father. And it reminded me of this verse also in Hebrews. It says, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in all things that, as we are yet without sin. Uh, and it just reminds me that Jesus does know to a degree and maybe even to a, a depth um, that we can't understand the same struggles that we have. He knows what it's like to have a single mom, at least at some point in his life. He knows what it's like to have been to a funeral of a loved one at a young and tender age. It, you know, maybe Joseph died in his 20s or so. Again, we don't know. It's a matter of, of, uh, of analysis and interpretation. But Jesus experienced loss um, at, in, in his life, and I just think that helps us uh, appreciate uh, that he also understands um, our, our challenges that we face as well. Now, a lot of these things that I'm going to be sharing with you and just in, in gearing up for the message, these statistics are old, um, but I would tell you they're probably not better since these uh, uh, statistics that I've gotten. These are about 10, 15 years old from the, the journals and things that I've got them. But I would suggest to you, it's not like we've had a revolution in America where all of a sudden fatherhood has gotten better, right? It's, it's, it's a challenge. Fatherhood and crisis in America. A third of American children do not live with their biological fathers. A third. A fourth of American children have no identifiable father figure at all. Is that a problem? 40% of children in single mother homes go a year or more without seeing their fathers. A year or more without seeing their fathers. Uh, these are just the statistics, um, and I, I read an, an article, it wasn't that long ago, probably four or five years ago, that talked about the, uh, it, it was trying to make divorce not be as bad um, for children as sometimes society makes it out to be, and it was saying, you know, even though parents get divorced, the father can be just inv involved in the, in the child's life as, as though they were married, and in some cases, that's true. In some cases, the father continues to be very engaged. But we know, again, through, through research and through statistics, that that's the exception. Generally, in a divorce situation, it's the father who has less and less connection, sometimes by his choice, sometimes by other factors in a child's life. Now, what happens in a society that has these types of, of challenges? We know that children growing up without a father figure are six times more likely to live in poverty. They're two times more likely to experience infant mortality, two times more likely to drop out of high school, 
to experience obesity, seven times more likely to experience teen pregnancy, and eight times more likely to run away. That's just the facts, just the statistics. In addition, they're at increased risk for criminal behavior, abuse, suffering behavioral problems, um, drug and alcohol abuse, and to attempt suicide. Uh, Do fathers make a difference? It's not a matter of conjecture. It's not a matter of, of subjectivity. It is just a reality that as fatherhood suffers in a society, the rest of society suffers with it. And so we are given um, a good cause to, to look at these realities. An article from 2011, America is rapidly becoming a fatherless society, or perhaps more accurately, an absentee father society. The importance and influence of fathers and families has been in significant decline since the Industrial Revolution and is now, according to the author here, Ray Williams, um, writing in Psychology Today, is now reaching critical proportions. If it was critical in 2011, has it gotten better in 2024? I don't think it has. I don't think so. I don't think we've seen, a, again, a, a resurgence of societal appreciation for fatherhood. As a matter of fact, I think it's going the other direction, and, uh, and, and we could get into that debate. He quotes some other um, researchers here. Blankenthorne argues that America is facing not just the loss of fathers, but the erosion of the ideal of fatherhood. Not just that fathers are becoming less of an impact in society, but even the quality or the desire for the father um, to have a role is eroding in our society. Another author writes, few people doubt the fundamental importance of mothers, Uh, Popeno says that, but increasingly the question of whether fathers are even necessary is being raised and said by many... Uh, and said by many to be merely a social role that others, mothers, partners, stepfathers, uncles, aunts, and grandparents can place. Now, I don't want to just absolutely agree, though, with what um, Brian said earlier. Others can step in and step up to that role, and some do. Some, some people are raised by a grandfather, or they have a significant other male that, that does step up, and that is great, and that's a blessing, but it's a tragedy that it has to happen. It's a tragedy when fathers are completely absent in someone else. So whether or not society is correct on this, I think is, continues to be found in the statistics, the decline of fatherhood and the male identity crisis. Now, the Bible has, as, as Jackie pointed out, a lot to say about fathers. It's uh, it mentioned many times, obviously talking about God as our father, but also giving instruction to earthly fathers. And just a couple of quick verses here from the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to, write, I want to remind you of something, Jews. Sometimes when we're reading our Bible, we, we detach uh, sometimes the physical author uh, from the subject matter because we know it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. But I don't think it's incorrect to also remind ourselves of the context of the author who wrote these. Paul never had children. Okay, I don't know if you're aware of that. The Apostle Paul never had children. So when he's giving instruction, he's giving instruction as an individual who's not experienced it as a parent, he's probably writing it from the experience of the child. Is that okay? So when Paul writes this, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, he's not writing that from the perspective of a father because he was never a father. Now, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Don't get me wrong, George. Don't write me up. Don't tell Ed Keys that I'm going down the wrong path here. Okay, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he is writing this from the perspective of having only known his father provoking him to anger. Does that make sense? Because Paul never was a father. Not that you can't empathize and, and, and relate with people that, you know, you don't have the same experiences, but he writes, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We, we're familiar with this, and we, we know that this is instruction given to us by God. But, but Paul is writing it probably because in that time and that place, it was common that that's how fathers treated their children, antagonizing them, demanding of them, provoking, aggravating. A similar phrase in Colossians, fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. And again, these instructions, very similar, you know, in tone and meaning. The word exasperate can also mean embitter, aggravate, nag. And it seems to be that those were the common detractors in Paul's time in society that would often separate the family because of how fathers sometimes treated their children. Now, I know I have never done this to my children. 
I've been perfectly, are you listening? Apparently, no one's listening. I do things like this just to make sure you're listening, right? No, I, do any of you as a father, do, do, do any fathers, are you willing to kind of read this and say, yeah, I've been there. I remember how I sometimes got a little bit aggravated with my kids. Boy, a lot of liars today, too. No, okay, a mother raises her hand, too. Yeah, okay, some, some, no, we relate with this because it's true. It's true. And so these reminders are there, and, and they're good counsel to us in dealing. Yes, the Bible in the, in the Ten Commandments, honor your, the, the role of the child is to honor your father and mother. But boy, mom and dad should not take advantage of that. Just because in, children are instructed to honor the parents, the parents need to be careful that they're not abusing that honor and provoking or embittering or aggravating or provoking their children as, as, as the, the counsel is here. So I want to come now back to Jesus' relationship with his earthly father, Joseph. And I, I've, I've done this before in, in, in brief times, again, around Christmas time is when we often think of, of Joseph. It's interesting how much we know about Joseph. There are a lot of major characters in the Bible who do amazing things, prophets and priests and kings and, and, and heroes of the Bible that we know less of than we know of Joseph. We're actually given quite a bit of information. He's a righteous man, according to Matthew, a descendant of Judah and David. We know his hometown. We know his occupation. We know the names of four other children that he had, the four boys, and that he had at least two daughters because they are called sisters, plural. So Jesus had at least six siblings, six siblings growing up. And we know that God speaks to him in dreams four times, which obviously connects him with Joseph of the Old Testament, also who God spoke to in dreams. So we know quite a bit about this man. We also know he was very poor, okay, uh, through various ways of interpreting the Bible and understanding the context. Now just think about what Joseph as a father, and Mary too, don't get me wrong, this is a partnership um, a reality, um, but this is also something that the father of Jesus, Joseph, had to help his son navigate in his early life, accusations of Ill illegitimacy. Now, in, that's even hard to a degree today, but in, in Jesus' day, this was a big deal. If you had an illegitimate family, people wouldn't trade with you. They would not, you know, you'd bring your goods to market. Oh, are you Joseph, that one with the illegitimate? No deal with you then. Your name became, uh, you know, uh, limited in what you were doing. This was a big deal. So Joseph and Mary had to help navigate the family through this issue of the appearance of them being inappropriate in having Jesus. We, we understand that. We're reminded of that. Uh, the, the competition among the siblings. Now, we do see this in the life of Christ later on after his baptism. It, there's a sense of jealousy or a sense of, of embarrassment even as Jesus is going about his ministry on the part of his siblings. They even tried to constrain him at one time as a grown-up. So you know that there had to be... Now, every child has a Messiah complex. Every child thinks they're the center of the universe. Every child thinks and, and, and is special to a degree. But can you imagine if you were actually related to the Messiah? You know... I, and again, the imagination can take you in places you've got to be careful, but it couldn't have been easy for the other siblings as well. Having Jesus, the perfect Son of God, the blessings of Jesus, but in your own insecurities, in your own sinful brokenness, that had to have been a challenge to grow up in that. So again, we could wax eloquent and go into all kinds of ideas of what that was like. We know Nazareth was a rough place. It was not... Uh, Scottsdale, right? It was more like downtown Phoenix, okay? The other side of the tracks, as it were. Um, Nazareth was a rough town. Joseph had to help Jesus navigate uh, simple and humble living there. We know that Satan was constantly attacking the family, even to the point where the, uh, Herod tries to destroy Jesus as a child. Now, the devil didn't stop after that story, guys, just because that's the last story that we know of, that Herod tries to destroy Christ, right? And so they flee to Egypt. And then Herod dies, and so the family moves back to Nazareth. And then, oh, then the devil just forgot about Jesus? Oh, I missed him. I guess I don't get to have any more chances at him. Now, again, these silent years, we, we, again, we only have limited knowledge about, but you can bet, you can understand 
that Satan continued to try to disrupt and destroy this family. And Joseph and Mary were the two that had to help the Lord weather those years. Challenge. He knows our challenges. He grew up having challenges, just like we have challenges. Now, I know this story gets used ad nauseum, and I'm just going to um, uh, attach to it briefly because it's the only biblical story that we have between uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Christmas elements and then his baptism later on. So Jesus, at the age of 12, comes to his very first Passover. They're in Jerusalem. He gets separated from mom and dad, um, picking up the story. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found... After three days... Those must have been some stressful three days. We've lost the Messiah. Can you imagine the, the burden of Joseph and, and Mary? What are we going to do? We've lost the Messiah. But after three days, they find him. And there he is sitting in the temple in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And there's a lot of different ways that you can apply this story and, and, and learn from it and see how God was developing in Jesus the qualities needed for him to sustain his role as the Messiah. But there's just one element here that I, I think is, again, worth remembering. And again, sometimes we get the idea that when Jesus was incarnated, when he came to this earth, that somehow God did something so unique with him that it kind of preserved him from the normal challenges. And there certainly were unique things about Jesus in his incarnate existence and, and as the Messiah. But I want to remind you that it's not like God just, uh, uh, like uh, through osmosis, just poured wisdom into him and he didn't have to work for it. And just the question, notice that bottom verse, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Question, where did he get that? Where did he get it? Where did he get those understandings and those answers? Is it just because he was the Messiah? Is it just because God, uh, you know, just gave his brain a spark of wisdom that no other human being has ever had before, that he just had to think real hard, and all of a sudden the great mysteries of the universe just came to him without any effort, without any instruction? Now, again, there is an element of uniqueness. I'm not trying to eliminate that totally from the experience of Christ. But how many of you here would agree that his parents played a role in his understanding and his, and his ability to have the answers needed at the age of 12? Come on now, guys. Do you think Mary and Joseph were just figureheads? Just make sure he eats enough. Just make sure he's protected. Make sure he gets enough sleep. And God does the rest. Just send them to TCE. Just send them to TAA. I don't got to do anything. Let them handle it. Uh, yeah. Okay, the parents, including dad, including the father, contributed to Jesus' character, his personality, and his trust in God and his ability to know the Scriptures. Just one verse from Desire of Ages. It is not correct. No, actually, this is not from Desire of Ages. This is from um, uh, the commentary, from the commentary. It is not correct to say, as many writers have said, that Christ was like all children. He was not like all children. Many children are misguided and mismanaged. I think that's true. Many children are misguided and mismanaged because we're all human and we're still working these things out. But Joseph and especially Mary, notice both are here, and Mary plays a large role, but Joseph is there as well, kept before them the remembrance of their child's divine fatherhood. And Jesus was instructed by Joseph and Mary in accordance with the sacred character of his mission. They raised Jesus knowing that he had a heavenly father. And that's our job with our children as well, to raise our kids to know that they have a heavenly father. And they have a sacred mission as well. They have a purpose. God has a plan for their lives. And Joseph and Mary helped Jesus. Joseph provided Jesus with a lot of things, three 
uh, quick things, education, discipline, and occupational training that would help sustain Jesus in His life and mission. Several verses that talk about this. Oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us. Our fathers took the time to remind us, to tell us, to inform us of the work that you did in their days, in the days of old. It is part of the job of fathers to tell their children about the great things that God has done in our life. To make sure that they know that there's a God in heaven that loves them. When it comes to discipline, love it. Love discipline. Yes. I love giving my son discipline, my daughter discipline. I don't like it myself so much, right? We love it for others. We don't always love it for ourselves, you're right. But notice what Proverbs says. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof, excuse me, his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Fathers provide boundaries. Fathers provide, so do mothers, but it's instructed here, even as a father provides boundaries. Our society does not like boundaries right now, guys. If you try to put boundaries on your children, you're going to get pushback from our society. We don't believe in boundaries as a society anymore. Drugs, no boundaries anymore. I don't want to get into it, but you know what I mean. If you listen to the news, if you're following at all, we are not a society that likes boundaries. But the Bible says it's important as fathers that we provide boundaries, discipline for our children, and training, giving them instruction. Is this not the carpenter? This is a reference to Jesus. How did Jesus learn to become a carpenter? Did he just wake up one day and all of a sudden all the mathematical understanding of how to put wood together and split wood and and build furniture just, just God poured into him? Or did he work in the wood shop with his dad? And learn the instruction and training to have that that laboring ability. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? And here you see the names of his brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And are not his sisters, at least two, in order there to be sisters. Maybe there's 12. We don't know. But at least two. He had a large family. And they took, this. notice this, the siblings took offense at Jesus. Rough, rough. He didn't have it smooth growing up. But you don't want to know one way we can be assured that we've been successful as a parent and as a father is when, it, when the final test really comes, when character is really tested, how do our children respond? Jesus will cry out to his father three times during his final moments of passion, once in the garden and two on the cross. And I just want to point those time, times out to you today um, as we draw to a close in appreciating the role of the Father. First, Jesus cries out in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, your will be done. The absolute supreme trust in the will of the Father. When, when, you're, when you're tried to the fullest, you know that you've been successful as a parent if your child still trusts in God at the time of greatest trial. Then on the cross, Father, he cries out, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Can you imagine at this time of ultimate torment, he's just been nailed to the cross, that his first motivation is one of mercy. Mercy. Father, forgive. Father. That, dads, Moms, parents, that is something that we can teach our children. That is something that we need to know ourselves. That at put to the greatest trial, the first motivation is one of mercy, not retribution, not father, go get them. Father, forgive. Boy, that takes a miracle, doesn't it? That's not natural. That's not something we can just grit our teeth and say, I'll do it. I'm just going to do it because I want to. That takes the Holy Spirit changing and converting our broken temptation and making it more in line with a Father who is compassionate. And then finally, as Jesus breathes his last, one more time does he address the Father. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
Even in the face of death, Jesus trusted his Father. His Father. And he learned these things through his study of Scripture, through his prayer life with his Heavenly Father, through uh, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, but also through the instruction and the boundaries and the love of Mary and Joseph. They played a role in helping Jesus in in trusting his heavenly Father. I want to end with a video. We're going to see if we can make this work, but let me set it up for a second. Any of you heard of Team Hoyt? Where's Mark? Uh, You you have to, of course. Okay, a few of you. Um, It's a a remarkable story, and I just want to give you some context in, in the in, in, in setting up uh, the, the video, um, Rick Hoy is the one with cerebral, cerebral palsy in the chair, and then that's his father, Dick. Um, they became famous for running uh, road races together. Um, they're from Massachusetts. Both of them have actually just uh, passed away in the last few years, unfortunately. But when uh, Rick was born, they found that he had uh, cerebral palsy, and in the 1960s, there weren't as many resources and, and knowledge and, and opportunities, and they were told, you better put him into an institution. No school can help, help him. You can't really take care of him at home. But they said, no, he's our son. We're going to take care of him. At the age of nine, um, they were able to work with a technology company that provided him with a special chair and a special communication device, whereby tapping his head on a screen and using the one motor uh, control that he had limited control of, he was able to speak through a computer and begin to communicate. And so at the age of nine, he was first able to go to school, and they learned how intelligent Rick really was. As a matter of fact, the very first words he spoke on that computer, everyone was taking bets because they got the computer set up, and they tested it, and he was about to speak his first words and, and his mom was like, he's going to say, Mom, I love you. Those are going to be, his. and the dad was saying, oh, Dick was saying, no, no, he's going to say, uh, hi, Dad, you know, you're the best, or something like that. And the very first words he said were, go Bruins, because the Boston Bruins were going for the Stanley Cup that year. So the first words that he spoke through that computerized chair were, go Bruins. But anyways, uh, a few years later, Rick found out that a disabled um, individual in his community was having a charity race to raise money. Uh, for people with disabilities. So he typed out on that computer, Dad, I want to enter into that race. I want you to push me in that race. And so Dick said, okay, I will. And so it was a five-mile race. He put Rick in the wheelchair, and they ran, they began the race. And, and he says that everyone thought that they would just stop, you know, after the first corner or the first mile. But he says, we actually finished the race. We came in second to last, but we finished it, the whole five miles. But the remarkable thing that happened is, uh, and this was the catalyst for the story that would develop, is when they came back home and Rick got back into his chair, he typed out on his computer, Dad, when I run with you, I no longer feel disabled. I don't feel handicapped. And so this message just really reverberated with the family. And so Dick began to train and prepare. He would run, um, when, when Rick was in school, he would put bags of concrete on the chair and he would train running uh, to build up his endurance so they could do more races um, to push Rick because that was one way in which he and his son could do something together that brought you know, joy and, and a sense of, of uh, community to his son, Rick. So they became known as Team Hoyt. They ran marathons together. They did the Ironman together. Um, and it's just very inspirational. So I want to see, this is going to be a little bit of a test. I want to see if we can make this video and music work together, guys. If you can go ahead. Can you turn off the lights as well? I know I'm asking for like five things at once. Lights, camera, action.
Is it a no go? Sometimes I can only we just it's not gonna work. Okay. Hey, you know, tried to do something and it just didn't work out. So unfortunately, it's a really great uh illustration of this father and son competing in the Iron Man. Um, and it's really inspirational about the lengths to which a father goes to support a son. Um, maybe we'll get it to play another time, but uh, if you get a chance, you can look up uh, Team Hoyt and learn more about their story and their journey. I think it uh, illustrates very well the human capacity uh, of God to work through fathers on the, beh ben on the behest and benefit of their child. But close out then from Matthew 7. You then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those that ask him? It's a privilege to be called a father. It's a privilege to know God as my father and I love my earthly father as well. And I know that God is coming again soon because we need our Heavenly Father to be with us, and we need to be with Him as well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You that we can just spend a few moments today reminding ourselves of these few related elements to this part of our world that You've created. When You made Adam, You knew that You were making him to also be a father. You gave him Eve instruction have children. And so from the very beginning, you as a father had a heart for making the family be part of our world. And so Lord, we just pray that as the community of faith, we would support the fathers and yes, support all the other elements that make a family dynamic and special. But for this moment, we thank you for the fathers and we ask that you would give wisdom and power blessings to us, that we would be the type of fathers that you want us to be. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.